is not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. Just Tuesday of this week, I was talking to a brother in Christ, and he was telling me about a conversation he was having with the preacher friend, and, and this preacher friend was telling him that one of his elders never attends both services on Sundays. And I was just blown away by that. I said, one of his elders? And he said, yes. He said, this elder argues that he doesn't have to. In fact, he, he appealed to some denominational literature online, and he put together an argument to, to defend his case. And I said, this guy's an elder in the Lord's church? And he said, yes. Brethren, this was shocking to me. The congregation where I preach now, the South Haven congregation in South Haven, Mississippi, we are just south of the, the Memphis line. In fact, if you're ever in the Memphis area, come see us. We're a quarter mile south of Memphis, Tennessee. But where I preach there at South Haven, it's a very sound and solid, faithful congregation. But there's something that happens there every week. According to our statistics, our average Sunday morning attendance is 278. Our average Sunday night attendance is 213. Now, if you do the math on that, that means we have a 23% drop-off every week from Sunday morning to Sunday night. That means a fourth of our people don't come back on Sunday night. That means 65 people, you can do the math a lot of different ways, 65 people don't come back on Sunday night. The, the thing that's odd about that is, as I have traveled around to different congregations, I have found I think we're above average. We're doing pretty well. Now, I don't know how it is it will let. I have no idea. I intentionally haven't looked at your board because I didn't want to know what your numbers were before I talked about this tonight. But I've looked at some congregations that have a 50% drop-off from Sunday morning to Sunday night. And then a similar thing from Wednesday night. Now, I know we're kind of preaching to the choir tonight because the Wednesday night group is the faithful of the faithful, but that's my assigned topic tonight. Now, I also want to say this. I recognize that there are some mitigating factors, some things that are legitimate that cause people not to come back on Sunday night. I gotta say that because someone will always uh, feel guilty. Usually it's the most faithful people who feel guilty. I know sometimes it's health problems why people don't come back on Sunday night. I know that you've got sometimes elderly people who can't drive and they can't come back. I know sometimes it's visitors. You've got visitors on Sunday morning who don't come back on Sunday night. But brethren, listen to me. A certain percentage of that drop-off from Sunday morning to Sunday night is simply because people choose not to come back. They are capable, they are physically able, but it's inconvenient. You know, they've got something they'd rather do. You know, this is my day off, I've got a recreational activity, my family is in town, and, and what it just comes down to is it is a matter of priorities. Once a year at the South Haven, at least once a year at the South Haven congregation, I preach on the subject of attendance. And the reason I do that is because I believe that it is one of the most basic, one of the most tangible forms of faithfulness. Now listen and think about that. One of the most tangible forms of faithfulness. Because a person who doesn't attend faithfully really can't say that he's going to go to heaven. Now somebody says, well, you know, I attend pretty good. You know, I, I, attend, I attend some. Is, isn't that good enough? Friends, may I suggest to you tonight that we don't believe that and we don't practice that with reference to most of our affairs in our lives? I mean, if you think about absenteeism, think about your job and absenteeism. It's only with a very good reason that they're going to excuse you from being at your job. They, they expect you to be there. In fact, there are some jobs, even if you have a good reason and you're absent a lot, they're still going to have to let you go because they'll say, you have to be here. Your job can't be done if you are not here. Your presence is something uh, upon which they in insist. And so what if you went to work and you told your boss, well, you know, I didn't come in yesterday because my family was in town. I hadn't seen them in a while. I just decided I was going to stay and visit. How would that go? Think about school for a moment with me. Absenteeism is not something that is just pushed aside in school. They are very serious about you being there. I don't know how it is now, but I know when I was in school years ago, I believe it was if we had 10, I think it was 10 unexcused absences in the school year, you failed. They were very serious about it. Now, you could have more if you had doctor's excuses, but only with a very, very good excuse were they going. And, and what if you went to the principal and, and you said, well, I didn't come in yesterday because, you know, gas prices are too high. And I thought I'd save a little money on gas. And so, Is that going to fly? How, how's it? You know, even in civic organizations, sometimes in civic organizations, they say if you're going to be a member, you got to come. 
you got to be here. They take roll call. And if you don't come, then at some point there's going to be consequences. But when we talk about the church, sometimes we think that's different. Brethren, it's not different. It is not different. In fact, I want to suggest something to you tonight, and that is the fact that when we assemble with God's people, particularly on the Lord's Day, when we assemble with God's people, we are doing something that is sacred, something that is really sacred. Now, how many things do you do in your life that you consider to be sacred? When we gather together on the Lord's Day, we are worshiping the Creator of the universe. We are worshiping the one who gave his son to die for us so that we don't have to spend eternity in hell. In fact, I want you to think about this. What if you knew, what if there's some way that you could know that this Sunday was going to be your last Sunday? What if you knew that you were going to die on Monday? How would you feel about being here this Sunday? Would you say, you know what, I'm just going to skip, uh, I'm, I'm going to skip out, there's a television show, I'm tired. You say, no, I would be there. I would be there absolutely. I would be there Sunday morning. I would be there Sunday night. You know, one of these Sundays is going to be our last Sunday. Now, I'm not trying to be morbid, but what if you knew on Monday morning they would be assembling at the funeral home for you? How important would it be for you on Sunday to be here? Brethren, may I suggest to you that when it comes to worship, our worship of God, it ought to be very sacred to us, and it ought to be that way every single time we come together. What we're talking about tonight is faithfulness in the assembly. I had someone come to me one time, and he said, you shouldn't preach on that. That's not something that you should preach on in, in a sermon. That's, it's offensive, and it's not a Bible topic. And may I suggest to you that the Apostle Paul preached on it? May I suggest to you that the Holy Spirit addressed it? And may I suggest to you that if a preacher is going to preach the whole counsel of God, he has to preach on this subject. And so I was very glad to be assigned this topic tonight. Now here's our text. Open your Bibles tonight to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24. That's introductory. Let's get into our text here. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24. Of course, this is the go-to passage. We know this verse. This is the one we always go to to talk about attendance because it says it so plainly. Hebrews 10 and verse 24, the Bible says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope, now listen, without wavering. When people don't attend as they should, they are wavering. Hebrews 10, 24, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Verse 24, that was verse 23. Verse 24, And let us consider one another in order to stir up one another. That is, to motivate. That is, I'm going to encourage, I'm going to push, I'm going to motivate my brethren to do this. Let me motivate them to love and good works. How? Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. That is, as the habit of some is. The habit of some people, he says, is to forsake the assembly, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now somebody might say, God, what's the big deal? You know, it's not like we're talking about people uh, who are drunkards. You're talking about people who are unfaithful in their attendance, and you're talking like they're unfaithful. I just don't know what the big deal is. But brethren, it is a big deal. It is a sin. Absenteeism is a sin. Whether you choose to miss once or you choose to miss for months, absenteeism is a sin. And this is what I want to do in the next several minutes tonight. I want to list for you seven reasons why it is the case that it is a sin to intentionally absent yourself from the worship assembly. And as we go through these reasons, when we get done tonight, I hope that you will be able to appreciate this and that you'll be concerned about those who are not faithful in attendance and that you'll assess yourself and say, I'm always going to be there. If the doors are open, I'm always going to be there. Number one, absenteeism is a sin because it shows contempt for God. Now you say, contempt. Don, is that the word you want to use? That's a strong word. Or Are you sure that you mean that? Let me illustrate and see if you agree with what I mean. Let's suppose that you and I make a lunch date and we say this Tuesday at 11 o'clock we are going to meet together at such and such a restaurant and uh, we're going to uh, visit. We're going to have lunch and we're going to visit. And let's say you show up at 2 o'clock, uh, at 11 o'clock on Tuesday and you're waiting for me but I never show up. And let's say that the next day we run across paths with one another and you say, hey, where were you yesterday? I was there at 11 o'clock. I was waiting for you. And I said, well, 
I didn't have any particular reason for it, but, you know, no, no big excuse. I just chose to do something else. How would you feel about that? How would you think I felt about you if I said that? You would say, he doesn't care about me. I mean, he, obviously, he shows contempt for me. We make an appointment. He doesn't care a bit. Or how about this? Let's suppose you and I have three appointments a week that we're going to be together. And I don't mean some loose thing like, you know, let's get together and do lunch sometime. But I mean, we say Monday at 11 o'clock, Wednesday at 11 o'clock, Friday at 11 o'clock, we're going to get together and we're going to address such and such topic. We've got plans. And two out of those three times every week, I don't show up. What would you say? What would you think my opinion of you would be? You would say, he doesn't think very much of me. I'm obviously not high on his list. I'm not important to him because he ditches me two-thirds of the time. Sometimes people will say this, do I really have to come to all of the assemblies of the church? I mean, Sunday night and, and Wednesday night. Let's suppose we ask it this way. What if a man were to say this, do I really have to go home to my family every night? What if a man said that? What if a man said, you show me the law that says I have to go home to my family every single night? And the answer is, there's no law that specifically says you have to go home to your family every night. But if a man chooses not to go home to his family every night, he shows contempt for his role as a husband. He shows contempt for his role as a daddy. He shows it doesn't matter to him. It's not important for me to be there. And brethren, here's the thing. A person who chooses not to faithfully attend the services of the Lord's church, what he is saying is, I really don't love the Lord very much. You don't have to have a law that says you have to come to worship. I had a preacher say to me one time, he said, I don't think that Sunday night attendance and Wednesday night attendance are really that important. I could hardly believe what I was hearing. I thought, this is a gospel preacher telling me he doesn't think Sunday night and Wednesday night are that important. Friends, listen to me. The fact of the matter is, when a person chooses not to attend when he could attend, he's really showing signs of a deeper problem. He's showing that he doesn't love the Lord with all of his heart, all of his mind, all of his strength, and all of his soul. That's the greatest commandment. He's showing that he's really not seeking first the kingdom of God. Somebody said, I want a command that says I have to be there on Sunday night. Here it is, Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. When you say, I've got something else I'd rather be doing on Sunday night, you're not seeking first the kingdom of God. When you say, I'm not coming on Wednesday night, you're not seeking first the kingdom of God. Here's the thing, here's the point. You shouldn't have to have a law that says you have to be there. There's a serious spiritual problem when you say, you show me, and that's what I've heard people say over the years, you show me a verse that says I've got to be there on Sunday night. When a person says that, I think they've got serious spiritual problems. There's something lacking in their life. The fact that they ask that question shows that they've got very serious spiritual problems. Number one, absenteeism is a sin because it shows contempt for the Lord. Number two, absenteeism is a sin because it's a failure to do a known good. Now, James chapter 4 and verse 17, James says, To him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is a sin. You know, the funny thing about this topic is, no one would dispute that it's a good thing to go to services. I think that people who aren't even church-going people, if you ask them the question, you think it's a good thing to go to church regularly? Most of them would say, yeah, it's a good thing. I don't think there's anyone here, certainly people who believe the Bible, whether you're faithful in your attendance patterns or not, if, you, if we were to ask you, do you think it's a good thing to faithfully attend services, we would always say yes. Sunday morning, yes. Sunday night, yes. Wednesday night, yes. Gospel meeting, yes. We would all say it's a good thing. Absenteeism is a sin because it's a failure to do a known good. James 4, 17. Number three, absenteeism is a sin. Now listen to me, because it is disobedience to a plain commandment of God. Now what I mean by that is, there's no ambiguity in this passage. I mean, when you listen to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25, he says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. That is, he says, some people have the habit, of, even in the first century, some people had the habit of skipping worship. He said, that is the habit, and he says, not forsaking the assembling of, of ourselves. It is a plain commandment. I know of a couple who some, at some point in their lives, years ago, they made the decision and they said, we are going to attend on Sunday morning only. We're not going to attend Sunday night. We're not going to attend Wednesday night. And for decades now, that has been their habit. You know, there are some things about Christianity that are optional. 
You know, what time we meet on the Lord's Day, that's completely optional. You know, we could meet, if, if the church here decided to, the elders could say, you know, the Lord requires us to meet on the first day of the week. We're going to meet at 2 o'clock on Sundays, and we're going to meet for four hours, and then that's all we'll do on the Lord's Day. Would there be anything wrong with that? There wouldn't be anything wrong with that. You could do that. That would be scriptural. It, it appears that in the first century they met for one uh, worship service, but it was longer. It's, a, it's an optional thing. Where we meet, that's an optional thing. You know, we've got a church building, but we don't have to have a church building. We could meet in somebody's house. Would there be anything wrong with that? If you, could have, if you had a house big enough to, to house everyone, there wouldn't be, we don't even have to have a building. We could meet under an oak tree and worship. Be anything wrong with that? See, those things are optional. But when it comes to the fact that we meet, that is not optional. This is not something that, that we can say we'll choose to do it or choose not to do it. It is a direct commandment from God. You know, sometimes if you're going to have a race, the guys will line up and they're going to be running and then a man will have a gun and he'll fire a blank and when he fires that everyone's going to take off running and if a man before he fires that gun if a man jumps up and starts running what do they say stop you violated the rules it's clear direct disobedience and that's what we're talking about it is direct clear disobedience to God if you simply say I'm going to forsake the assembly in reference to Christian living it's a direct command. I want you to appreciate with me in Luke chapter 14, beginning in about verse 16 and going through verse 21, our Lord tells a parable about a man who throws a great feast for his friends. And he prepares the feast, and when the feast day finally comes, he, his friends begin to make excuse. And one of his friends says, you know, I can't come. I bought a piece of land, and I need to go and see my land. Please excuse me from the feast. And then a second one, a second one of his friends said, you know, I just bought five yoke of oxen. I really need to go and test my oxen, and so I'm not going to come to your, your, your feast. Please have me excused. And then another one, he's very abrupt. He, he just says, have me excused. I married a wife, can't come. This is what the master of the feast says. Remember, the Lord is telling us this parable so we can learn something from it. The master of the feast, the householder, says to his servants, I want you to go and replace those guests. And he sent his servants out into the highways and the byways to bring in other people. And he said, those who made the excuses will not partake of my supper. Now, I know the application of this, but brethren, this is what I want you to get. God is not in the excuse-collecting business with reference to his direct commands. If you want to be faithful to the Lord, you have to come to the assembly. I even hate to say it that way, because when I say you have to come to the assembly, doesn't that indicate there's a problem already? If I say, you have to be here, all right, I'm going to be here because I have to be here. Isn't there a problem in your life spiritually if that's the way you're thinking? I'm coming because I have to. You see, if you love the Lord with all of your heart, no one's going to say, I'm here because I have to be. If you're seeking first the kingdom of God, nobody's going to say, I'm here because I have to be. What it would be is you can't stop me from being here. I get to go and worship. You know what David said? I was glad when they said unto me, let us go up into the house of the Lord. That's the attitude. When a person says, show me a verse that says i got to be, it's a problem. It's a serious spiritual problem. And that person's not going to go to heaven until they can change that, until they no longer ask that question anymore. Number four, absenteeism is a sin because it's a failure to give and to receive needed encouragement. Now, Hebrews 10, 24, the verse I gave you just a minute ago, begins this way. He says, let us consider one another. Let's stop right there and do that right now. Just consider the people around you. That's how the verse starts. Let us consider one another. My we're talking about attendance tonight. Attendance is not just about me. That's not how he begins the discussion. He says, let's consider one another and not forsake the assembly. You mean me forsaking the assembly has something to do with considering the people who are around me? That's exactly what he tells us when he begins this. Consider one another, he says, to provoke them, to motivate them to good works. How do you do that, Lord? He says, by not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. You know what? Right now, you are involved in encouraging the people around you. Right now, you are involved in, in motivating the people around you to be faithful to the Lord. Now, you might say, no, I'm not. I'm just sitting here. I haven't done it. I haven't done anything. What are you talking about? But we just sang a song, and we, we worship God, and that encouraged the people around you. We just prayed together, and that encouraged the people around you. 
You know, Ephesians 5, 18 and 19, Colossians 3, 16 says that when we sing, we teach each other, we admonish one another. When you do that, you encourage the people around you. How would you like to encourage people not to faithfully attend the worship service? You say, well, I wouldn't do that, Don. I, I would never think about doing that. I don't think there's a person in this audience tonight who would go out and catch somebody and say, hey, don't come on Sunday nights. Hey, don't come on Wednesday night. I don't believe any of us would say that. But you know what? Here's the point I'm making. Just as with our presence we encourage, by our absence we discourage. When you choose not to be here, and I don't mean something beyond your control. I don't mean you're sick and you can't come. I don't mean you can't see and you can't drive. I mean you choose not to be here. You are discouraging people who really need your encouragement. And you're not getting the encouragement that you need. That's why he tells us this is not just about you. Consider one another and don't forsake the assembly. You know, it is interesting. I have been to services sometimes on maybe a Wednesday night, maybe a Sunday night, and there was hardly anybody there. You ever had that? You walk in and it is just a ghost town. Nobody is there. How did that make you feel? It just brought me low. In fact, I was so discouraged. I thought, what is going on here? I felt kind of like Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19. You remember when Elijah said, Lord, I, even I only, am the only one left. Now, of course, the Lord says there are 7,000 who haven't bowed the knee to Baal, but that's how Elijah felt, and that's how I have felt sometimes. But you know what works the other way? Have you ever come to services and it is just packed? I mean, you can hardly get the seat and the singing is so good and it is, it's just full. How did that make you feel? You think, wow, this is so good. We're growing. We're serving the Lord. We've got unity. It just lifts you up and it's encouraging. That's exactly what he's talking about in Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. I preached for the church in Charleston, South Carolina for nine years. And during that time, we, when I got there, we were averaging 95 people. When I left, we were averaging almost 300 and so our little church building got to the point that we were just packed. We couldn't park all the cars in the parking lot. And I remember one Wednesday night, somebody came in, and he was so frustrated. He, he walked in late, and he said, I've been driving around the parking lot for five minutes. He said, I couldn't find a parking space anywhere. He said, I finally parked my car out on the road. You know how happy that made me? <laughs> he was irritated, but I thought, how encouraging that we've got this little building packed, that we're sitting uh, uh, chairs out in the aisle because we're doing the work of the Lord and we're doing it together. Why did the Lord make Christianity a group thing? Why didn't God just save us from our sins and say, you know, each of you are an island and you're not tied together, you know, just be a recluse and, you know, be a hermit and do your own thing. That's not what the Lord did. The Lord said Christianity is a group thing. I want you to be together. I want you to sing together. I want you to assemble together. Why did He do that? Brethren, it's because he knew that we needed encouragement. He knew that we needed to be together. All week long, you're out with people in the world and, you know, ungodly people. They don't care about the Lord. They don't care about living right. They don't care about their families the way they should. You need to be with people of like precious faith who care about the same things, who want to go to heaven, who can encourage you, who can lift you up, and together we walk arm in arm and help each other go to heaven. That's the way the Lord made Christianity. Number five, absenteeism is a sin because it contributes to ignorance. In Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6, when I was a kid growing up in Charleston, we used to call him Hosea. Nowadays, I hear everyone saying Hosea. I still call him Hosea. Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6 says, My people are destroyed. God said, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. That's ignorance. My people are destroyed because of ignorance. To go to heaven, you've got to know the will of God. Now, I want you to imagine something with me. Every time we come together, imagine that you learn one fact. And I would certainly hope that's true. If you're a person who pays attention and listens, hopefully when we have a Bible study or we have a worship assembly uh, preaching, you would learn at least one fact. Let's suppose this takes place for 10 years. You've got one man who attends Sunday morning only for 10 years, learns one fact. At the end of 10 years, there's 52 weeks in a year, 10 years, 52 times 10, he will have learned 520 facts. Now let's suppose that there's another man who comes on Sunday morning, and he comes Sunday night, and he comes Wednesday night, and he comes to Bible class, and let's say four times a week. 
that this person attends services. He's at gospel meetings and averages out to four times a week. And so over a 10-year period, he learns 2,080 things. One man has 520. The other man uh, learns uh, 2,080. Do you suppose there will be any difference between those two men spiritually? Do you suppose there will be any difference in their spiritual strength and the way they present themselves to God? Of course there's going to be a difference in those two men. And I want to ask you this. Which one of those men would you rather be on the Day of Judgment? You think they're going to be the same? You think they're going to pray the same? You think they'll be the same in the face of temptation? Here's the next one, number six. I really want you to listen closely to this one. Absenteeism is a sin because it dilutes your efforts to rear your children to be faithful Christians. Now somebody says, Preacher, why are you putting so much emphasis on worship and being at the worship assembly. Don't you know Christianity is a lot more than just coming to church? Of course it is. Of course it is. Christianity is a lot more than just coming to church. In fact, if that's all it is to you, you've got a problem. Because Christianity is something that takes place every hour of every day, of every week, every day of the year. But this is the point I'm making. I don't know of any other act that more demonstrates your faithfulness to Christianity, that more tangibly demonstrates that you're a faithful Christian than coming to the worship service. What do I mean by that? When people see you coming in the door, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, they say, that guy's a Christian. He's, he's a faithful Christian. It tangibly demonstrates that you care. Now let me get to this point. When parents skip worship services for activities of the world, they are teaching their children a lesson in priorities. They are teaching their children that sometimes there are things more important than the Lord. Now somebody says, but, you know, it's the championship game. And, and my boy, he is the best hitter. And he's just got, got to be there. And so you take him to the game, and they win that game, and, and he is the best hitter on the team. But you lose a spiritual battle that's going to impact him later in life. Somebody says... That, that means I'm going to have to make some serious sacrifices. If you're saying that I'm going to have to sacrifice, I'm going to have to give up some things, that's right. You mean to, to do the Lord's business, you've got to sacrifice. Who ever heard about sacrificing to be faithful to the Lord? That's the very point that we're making. Even if you have to sacrifice, I'm going to be there. And you know, school's just started, and we've got uh, people playing sports and and uh, high school uh, ball games are going on, and there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's a good thing. But it may be that Christian parents need to go to the coach at the beginning of the season and say this, look, we want our kids to play, but we are Christians first. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, gospel meetings, we are going to be, in fact, we'll come to the game and we'll be there right up until time for services. And if y'all aren't done, we'll come back after services, but we're going to be there. We're, we're going to make this a priority in our lives. What have you taught your kids if you do that? You have taught them that, the, that God is always going to be first. Now, parents will say, well, you know, we've got our kids at worship most of the time, except when they have homework. Sometimes I've known uh, parents that when there's a lot of homework on Wednesday night, they leave their kids at home, and I'll say, where's so-and-so now? Well, I had a lot of homework tonight. You know, your child might graduate and get a Ph.D. He might go to a prestigious school. He might make a lot of money. He might be one that you brag about, and you say he's got all of these secular things. But if he doesn't have this part right, seeking first the kingdom of God, it doesn't matter. You know, my child might get a Ph.D. and he might cure cancer, but if he doesn't get this part right, it doesn't matter. You know, Sol Solomon said, after going through the whole book of Ecclesiastes, <clears throat> he said, I tried everything this world had to offer. I tried money and riches and education and wisdom. And when he gets to the end of the book in Ecclesiastes 12, 13, he says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter fear God and keep His commandments. The King James says this is the whole duty of man. The word duty is added in the King James, which means it's not in the Hebrew. It actually reads like this. Fear God and keep His commandments. This is the whole of man. This is the entirety of man. Fearing God and keep his, keeping His commandments, that's all that man is about. That's what the Bible is telling us. And so, if I get a PhD and I cure cancer, but I don't fear God and keep His commandments, it doesn't matter. Now somebody says, Don, how could you say that? That's ridiculous that you could say it doesn't matter. 
I say that because God said the entire purpose you're here is to fear me and keep my commandments, and you did everything but that. That's why it doesn't matter. I heard an illustration, I don't know if it's true or not, but I heard that years ago during the Civil War, there was a man who was a watchmaker, and he got drafted into the Civil War, and his unit got deployed, and for a long time they were just stationed there, and they weren't going anywhere, so they were in tents, and for weeks they sat there. And so other soldiers and officers began bringing him their broken watches. And so he started working on watches, and he had a backload of watches that he was repairing in the weeks they were there, and, and he's sitting in the tent. And the day finally came, and they said, yeah, get your gear, it's time to deploy and go to battle. He said, I can't possibly go to, to battle right now. I've got too many watches to repair. What was the point? He forgot why he was there in the first place. Brethren, sometimes we forget why we're here in the first place. We're here to fear God and keep His commandments. And I might get tied up in all of these other things so that I forget the reason that I'm here in the first place. You may think this sounds like a, a strange thing, but when my wife was a senior in high school, she graduated in high school in 1988, and when she had her high school graduation, they scheduled it on a Wednesday night. And she went to the teacher who was in charge of the graduation, and she said, can we please get this changed? I have worship services on Wednesday night. And the teacher said, there's 250 students graduating. Are you crazy? We're not going to change this because you have worship services on Wednesday night. Then the teacher went before all the other kids and kind of mocked her and said, this girl wants us to change graduation so she can go to worship on Wednesday night. He wouldn't change it. She went to worship on Wednesday night. And her peers made fun of her and they ridiculed her. But you know what? I married her because I said, that is a woman who wants to go to heaven. That's a woman who's seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now, some people would say, there might even be, I hope there's not, but there might even be someone here tonight who says, well, that's ridiculous. Sometimes you've got to shift your priorities. Seek first the kingdom of God. Here's the last one. Absenteeism is a sin. This is going to sound redundant, but absenteeism is a sin because it's a sin directly against God. What I mean by it is this. It's true that you sin against yourself. It's true that you sin against your brethren when you are not here. But when you choose not to be here, it is a sin directly against God. Because what you were saying is this, God, I have something more important to do than to come and study your word and to worship you. Brethren, I think we need to make a very conscious effort. We need to have a conscious goal to have as many people here on Sunday night as we do on Sunday morning. You say, well, Don, we got a lot of visitors on Sunday morning. Then let's get a lot of visitors on Sunday night. <laughs> you know, sometimes it's, it's as simple as asking, and you'll get a lot of visitors. Maybe you're a person who's here tonight, and maybe you haven't been faithful in your attendance. And I, if that's the case, I would like to encourage you tonight to do some soul searching. Because if you haven't been faithful in your attendance, it's indicative of the fact that you don't love the Lord with all of your heart, mind, strength, and soul. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves as the manner of some is, but exhorting, encouraging one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. All right, we'll stop. Thank you for your good attention. I appreciate it so much.